about the high precision and sentience of visors. As you can notice, I mean, this is a um, project, is a team project. In particular, currently there are like four researchers in the lab working on this project. Toby, me, and other two, um, I think one master student, one PhD student. And in the past, there was also, I would say, several of the contribution of this uh, presentation also from Adam Koenig, which is an ex PhD and postdoc from this lab, which is currently working at Lockheed Martin. But maybe he's just recognizing. So, uh, in addition to the work we obviously have been doing in the lab, actually the virtual super optics and configurable swarm visor mission is the huge collaboration of multiple universities and institutions on the US. Um, in particular, I think that the main PI of the mission is actually from his professor Kamal Ambadi from the University of Illinois Urbana Champaign. Then all the scientific uh, payload part is actually done at uh, NASA Goddard. And then there is a big contribution also from Georgia Tech, in, and also there are industrial partners as Vulcanium technology. Uh, at high level, like the so why why visors? So visors obviously a distributed telescope, but the high level scientific goal is is to reveal individual energy release sites in the solar corona to test theories of coronal heating. In particular, the scale of the phenomena we are interested in imaging is on the sun of or more or less 100 kilometer, but look from Earth becomes something, requires kind of a resolution which is at the level of 0.15 arc, arc second, which is kind of like a resolution, um, a resolution threshold which is not achievable by current coronal, um, coronal, coronal telescopes. And in order to achieve that kind of resolution, we want to distribute the telescope payload on two separated uh, six cube cubesats, which are gonna, at observation time, operate at 40 meter distance, as you can notice like on the figure on the bottom, uh, on the bottom right. In particular, one of the two spacecraft contains a state-of-the-art um, optic sieve, which is designed at Goddard Space Rock Center, and the other one is then a Deta extreme ultraviolet detector, and in particular, the detector is going to look at the sun through the uh, sieve optic. So just to understand the science here, I'm just curious. So you're saying that the coronal mass ejections are in the form of sheets that are 100 kilometers thick. Exactly. So like, I'm not a huge expert, but in any case, like, what happens is that there is a kind of a peculiar trend of the temperature. Like, if you look kind of like at the profile of temperature across the sun. And there is this kind of like bump of temperature increase at the coronal, um, at the coronal uh, level, which is kind of not well understood from a scientific standpoint. And so there are like various theories in between one is that this kind of like temperature bump is due to this kind of like uh, sheets of like energy that are kind of like moving and have of the scale of like more or less 100 kilometers. And though need to be imaged at like a higher resolution than the one you can currently achieve with current like uh, solar telescopes. And the impressive thing is that obviously you want to achieve this kind of science using 262 two, two cubesats. So it's like low cost and very like uh, interesting uh, application. But let's go more into the details because um, at the very end we do GNNC. So at the very end what we actually care is like how to translate the, so what, I mean, we care about many things, but what is relevant to us, let's say, <laughs> is to translate the scientific requirements into GNC requirements, and in particular, like, pointing accuracy. Uh, and in particular, there are, like, three specific um, scientific requirements which then translate into pointing accuracy, and these are, like, the focus control, image drift, pointing accuracy, and also image stability. And in particular, as you can see depicted on the, on the right, these two requirements substantially translate in uh, the need of maintaining accurate, at al accurate alignment at 40 meter distance in space, in particular with uh, controlling the center of mass of the optic in, in, in the image specifically uh, within like a box which is of 15 millimeters by 18 millimeters with a stability of 0 0.2 millimeters per second across the 10 seconds of observation. And this kind of like alignment requirements, so as you can clearly imagine, we cannot uh, pretend to guarantee this kind of like alignment 
requirements at a 100% success, success rate. So from like a probabilistic standpoint, what we aim to achieve is having 20% of chances of having a good alignment for each attempt, which then by just concatenating kind of like the probability on multiple attempts, provide us the 90% of chance of having, of having at least one successful attempt over 20 observation. So we try to align 20 times, after 20 times probabilistically we have the 99% of chance of getting at least one good alignment if we are able to achieve on the single attempt like the 20% of likelihood. And this is kind of like uh, the main idea. Yeah, just, just to comment, this is a result of analysis yeah. because we uh, realized that it was impossible given the sensing and actuation uh, uh, capabilities we had to achieve the uh, uh, sigma uh, capability to meet the requirements. So this is yeah, it's yeah. not that we, that we like it, but it's what, what we are able to do. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. And, and on top of that, we also want to ensure near zero relative acceleration perpendicular to the line of sight during observation for image stability, which is another important requirement. Um, remaining the domain of, of requirements, uh, as we stressed, uh, we are talking about 262 CubeSats, which obviously contain low size, weight, and power, as well as conventional of the shelf components. In particular, obviously, the GNC is one of the subsystem which contains the most, like, Innovative, innovative idea and aspect which has to be kind of like technology tested in flight, but this is not the only subsystem. As a matter of fact, for example, Georgia Tech is developing a new propulsion subsystem. The University of uh, Ohio State University is developing a new cross-link technology. So we have multiple subsystems with substantial testing novel technology within this mission. And this from like, uh, I mean, it makes it very cool, but also from like a reliability and safety perspective, makes it also very, very challenging. And yeah. If I can comment, this yeah. doesn't follow NASA guidelines. Oh. <laughs> you know, uh, if, you, if you look at the NASA system engineering handbook, you know, uh, there is a, an interesting, you know, recommendation is you don't want to do in, uh, more than one miracle in a mission, okay? These are multiple miracles happening in the same mission, <laughs> so to say. Now, though, there are multiple miracles happening in the same mission, though with kind of like the strict requirements of bringing these two guys at 40 meter distance. And this kind of like connects to kind of like at the very end, like which is one of the main topic of this uh, presentation, which is kind of like provide high accurate navigation and control, but also like safe and full tolerant, as you will see. But in any case, looking for example, like on the on the right, I was just showing kind of like the classic risk matrix, and what I was what I was just saying in this in kind of like that representation is that in general, um, what you do you want to locate like a, the risk of a contingency within the risk matrix, and you want you want all the risk lying in general in the green or yellow area. But the problem is that usually the use of log swap and cost component tends to increase the likelihood of contingencies and therefore the risk possibly bringing them to the red area. So the only way of bringing the risk back to the yellow area is by mitigating the consequences, therefore thinking in a full tolerance uh, sense. Um, and I mean, going further in detail is this safety requirement. As a matter of fact, as I said, we have multiple uh, failure, possible like failure instances in these missions, which are like, mainly like hardware failures of, of multiple subsystems, which uh, the combination of those generates like possible contingencies which have to be located in the risk matrix and obviously mitigated and brought like in the safe yellow green area. And in order to do so, we have thought about multiple ways of mitigating risks, which are uh, mitigating consequences, which are uh, passively safe operations and both passively safe operations and also contingency plans as reactive and proactive, proactive escapes to bring like the formation in a safe configuration if something bad happens. And in addition, we're also reasoning about the formation flying aspect of this mission by assigning, so we have two spacecraft, but at the same time, we always want one of the two spacecraft being passive and the other one being active. So in nominal operation, we never have the two spacecraft controlling contemporary. And this kind of like allows us to kind of tackle some of these kind of like contingency scenario by like swiping which of the two space is controlling if one of the two is kind of like defectuous in general. Um, this also kind of like motivated a pretty articulated uh, concept of operation, which substantially we don't want to remain in close proximity too long. 
the four what we the, the old design is based off of like having a nominal standby relative orbit configuration in which substantially the, the spacecraft are separated a few hundred meters and then transferring to a science configuration when the spacecraft once per orbit achieve alignment at 40 meters and we are going to remain in this kind of like science configuration for example for 10 orbits along which for each orbit we make one we make one observation attempt and after we have finished these 10 observation attempts we transfer back to standby orbit where we can downlink in safety and with larger separation with no risk of like with way way less risk of, of collision and this kind of con ops then kind of kind of, kind of like that we obviously translate into the orbit design in this mission specifically the orbit design is kind of cool because um and has been optimally developed by uh, Adam, but in uh, kind of like absolute and relative orbit design intersect because as I was mentioning, we have this requirement of having a zero lateral relative acceleration during observations while having almost zero inertial relative velocity. This imposed like a requirement that you can see in the plot on the bottom right of having observation on the TN plane. So having the spacecraft so performing, having the two spacecraft aligned on the TN plane while, while looking at the sun. On the other hand, in order to have that kind of alignment in the TN plane while guaranteeing passive safety, this impose a constraint on the beta angle of the absolute orbit. Beta angle, which is the angle in between the orbital plane and the direction of the sun, which substantially imposes, since we want to launch in a sun sink orbit, imposes a constraints on the local time of ascending, of ascending node of the sun sink orbit. So essentially we have a requirement which is kind of like a relative motion requirement, which then kind of like emer emerge as kind of like a requirement on the absolute orbit. We have to comment on the fact that we have been selected by CSLI for launch. On the other hand, we don't know exactly yet in, because we are the, we're gonna be the secondary payload of like a bigger launch or bigger mission. So there is still some kind of like uncertainty on which exact orbit we're gonna be launched. By uh, we will desire kind of like a 10 a.m. sun sink with like an altitude of around 600 kilometers. From like a relative motion perspective, this kind of concept of passive safety is present throughout the full mission. And in general, passive safety means kind of being, um, always being in an orbital configuration, which is safe, not just in terms of a, like of instantaneous position, but safe even if we are gonna lose control and at any instance during this orbital configuration. And if we lose control, we must be safe up to a specified horizon, both in face of like uncertainties which may arise from, for example, navigation and um, also attitude, uh, sorry, attitude um, actuation. So, so out of curiosity, when you say the safe during transfer, does that mean safe to, I fail to execute the burn or safe I fail to stop the burn or? means you, you actually see a lot of plots <laughs> just afterwards but the safety we are talking now here is that if in any instant of the transfer the actuation fails so you stop controlling the generated uncontrolled trajectory will be guaranteed to be collision free for at least for example two orbits at three sigma okay. given the uncertainty which kind of like are generated by previous navigation and also this is actually quite important the last applied maneuver because this is actually is going to be way more clear when I'm going to show you the plot. But for example, if you apply a huge maneuver which has which is greatly uncertain, and then you lose control, this kind of uncertainty of the last applied maneuver propagates along the uncontrolled trajectory, which makes it very challenging to keep this kind of like uncontrolled trajectory plus the three sigma bounds out of the other spacecraft. But as you will see, we actually going to show results in which we're actually able to achieve that, which is kind of like a cool concept. Um, from a GNC architecture, so this kind of was kind of like orbit design, but from a, from a GNC architecture, actually, so we have a huge effort, which is actually the main effort we have currently, is the development of the actual GNC flight software. So uh, both for nav and control, and also the all the state machine of the high level GNC logic and the high level GNC logics. So those all pieces were developed here? Yes. The full GNC has been, is, is in development here. <laughs> Yeah. Where they're responsible for all this. <laughs> but as you can clearly see, we, Professor D'Amico already mentioned about digital, which is actually the next slide. And these are all, sorry, uh, the, the observations that you have there, they're all absolute observations, or they're also observations of the two 
Yeah, and you're going into the cover. No, if you want to come with me, but actually, you can also. So you're referring to that note of observations literally there and as the output of the GNC block? Yeah, in, in, in general, when you're doing navigation, are you doing well, relative like, observations? The yeah, inputs so. that we get are, are raw GPS measurements from uh, Novotel GNSS. Actually, that's what I was asking, so you but you're would, not. You would see the system there. So, correct. basically, uh, digital is called uh, uh, our. If you go back, oh, it's here. Yeah. Distributed multi GNSS standing localization system. Uh, it employs interface differential GPS techniques. So, the spacecraft exchange, yeah. Role, yeah. Role, uh, measurement to achieve that sub centimeter relative position knowledge. Yeah. Just, just curious on your architectural choice there between, you know, like you have those two spacecraft, would you, each one of these are getting GPS and you're transmitting back and forth to figure out where your relative positions are, as opposed to the spacecraft actually observing the other spacecraft and controlling relative to that? Um, so, uh, we have considered uh, the trades uh, uh, during phase A and phase A. Um, couple of considerations. So the first of all, there is a laser range finder on board as um, a potential aid to our precise red navigation. Um, second, uh, the problem with the camera that will be a telescope is uh, to obtain you know, precision bearing angles mm -hmm. and do the navigation. Uh, complement the RF uh, based navigation right. is that it's the limited field of view. Um, so um, it turned out during the you know, selection, identification and selection of sensors that it was not viable to have a camera with a field of view large enough to, to be able to, you know, to complement and also due to the limitation of power resources available to, to complement the navigation. But that certainly for a larger platform would be an option to complement um, RF base to with uh, vision navigation if you can select the camera to be you know, to a resolution that you need. Um, but it's not part of this mission. This mission relies primarily on digital, which is kind of a differential GNSS, cooperative, and maybe on an extra laser range find. However, um, there are a lot of caveats because these measurements refer to the actual you know, face center of the antennas, to the ons of the laser range finder, and so forth. And there are offsets and the knowledge of the position of these elements with respect to the center of mass is affected by errors. So at the end, one has to be very careful waiting, you know, and the extra sensor is providing just more noise, biases, exactly. but it's, a, it's, a, it's actually helping us. Yeah. Um, so, because yeah, ultimately at the end of the day, all you want to do is look through that hole, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, anyway, you, you want to comment on the now slides? Or is, uh, well, I have one more thing worth noting about this previous question, which is that we are far from the only clients of the system design here, and their requirements just from the fact of using a fairly off-the-shelf bus from Blue Canyon Technologies and also uh, point of requirements imposed by power constraints mm -hmm. that mean that we don't have the freedom to actually even use the laser range finder all of the time because sometimes we, we don't have the ability to actually point spacecraft at each other. We yeah. have to be optimizing for uh, our solar panels. So that that's also why using a fairly omnidirectional GPS receiver, which is just part of an off-the-shelf bus, it's a big advantage in this mission. Right. Right. It makes everything easier. Yeah. You don't need to, well, obviously you need to keep a plus minus those 15 degrees of the antenna, the GPS antenna both sides uh, towards Zenith uh, because we, want, we need to maximize the number of com commonly visible satellites, GPS satellites. Uh, however, this is a very benign requirement compared to what comes with a very directional uh, sensor. So, yeah. It gives a flexibility. Yeah, that makes sense. Like, keep saying hardware constraints are what feeds the GNC engineers. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. These slides kind of like, uh, has been explained mm -hmm. by the discussion, but as I said, for, for achieving, so you want to do differential GPS um, with integer with the resolution, and the main reason is obviously like the performance. I think you may have, have told me, Jeff. Uh, so the main reason, 
why we want to use this kind of live navigation technologies because we have already pretty substantial results in which we are able to achieve a sub-centimeter um, relative, relative position error and uh, sub-millimeter um, second uh, relative velocity error. This is with no maneuvers and then we also have results including maneuvers that bump up the error a little bit. But um, the, the, the fundamental thing here is that we really need this kind of like navigation performances if we uh, want to achieve the required like control accuracy. Yeah. Can I add one thing? Speaking about state of the art and control resolution, what you see here before activating into the navigator resolution on board, this is about what I had on a previous moment. Now, after activating the generator resolution, you see what we're able to, yeah. to get. So we get the integer numbers of the color phase bias, and we can exploit the millimeter no level noise of the color phase measurement to achieve that level of accuracy. Uh, and, uh, and also the good part is that besides simulation, we can evaluate this with the actual sensors with the signal simulator. So, so, sorry for the interruption. No, no, uh, this is, so like this kind of like, the step we like to make is that then we, we want to control and what the controller takes as input at the end is the um, is the state estimate from the navigation. So obviously, if the controller wants to hope to achieve mini, like sub-centimeter level uh, alignment and terminal control error, you, you clearly need like sub-centimeter or at least centimeter level um, navigation accuracy. Um, so the controller, here I, I'm going very high level, but the controller is gonna be constituted by multiple blocks, which are like a state machine, prediction blocks, decision logics, control algorithms, and also like a priority maneuver buffer, which is gonna kind of like um, decide when to emit, because we are gonna commit to maneuvers just before the maneuver has to be executed, because the maneuver plans, like through this kind of like pipeline of pre like prediction, decision logic, algorithm, et cetera, the maneuver plan is potentially updated anytime you receive a new state estimate. So we never commit to propulsion until we are kind of like certain in the sense that like we know we, we won't receive a state estimate which is gonna make us change our mind. And this is also like very important from like an escape and safety, um, safety perspective because we want to be always able to potentially scratch a maneuver, a maneuver plan we, we had planned it before in order to perform an escape and bring like the, the formation in safety. But kind of like the moral of the story of this very high level overview is that to achieve that kind of like alignment, and then I'm gonna show them plots and results just afterwards, we're gonna use a suite of algorithms which is like very diverse. In particular, in the phases of control kind of go together with the, with the modes of the mission. So standby mode is this kind of like relative orbital configuration in which we want to track a possibly safe pre-designed relative orbital configuration. And for doing this kind of tracking, we're gonna use close form uh, impulsive control solution. So it's kind of like a tracking which has control uh, accuracies of the order of like maybe a few tens of meters. Then to transfer, we are trading both close form solution and convex optimization algorithms potentially for doing the transfer in a possibly same manner. But still we are talking about of con terminal control accuracy of the level of like few meters, maybe five meters at the end of the transfer when you arrive at science with horizons which spans from like five to 10 orbits. When we arrive in the science mode instead, we need to kind of like aggressively bring the tracking error from like five meters down to sub-centimeters at observation. And this has to happen on a time which is like lower than one orbit, because obviously this observation happens once per orbit. So we need algorithms which are able to provide us with maneuvers, not on multiple orbits, but with maneuvers that can be applied on maybe like a quarter of an orbit or like half an orbit in order to cut down this tracking error from like few meters down to like sub-centimeters. And specifically here we are evaluating a couple of like numerical algorithms, one which is kind of like actually a very simple uh, fixed time maneuver solver, which is based on like Tikhonov regularizing the squares, and then a more fancy one, which is instead based on, it's kind of like a second order con program solver, 
which the underlying algorithms are both like an SOCP and a QP, uh, which differently from like the Tikkun regularized least square, which consists kind of like a, f a fixed time of the maneuver and just solves for the delta V in a least square sense. This one is that the SOCP solver also like try tries to select optimally the location of the maneuver over, the, for example, the half an orbit, and then minimize for like fuel expenditure. So you use the term trade, so you don't have a final selection of what you're using to execute these yet. We are going to implement both of those. But, though, but as you can say, in different modes, we are going to use different algorithms. So you're planning to implement all of these? Uh, we, we already, I mean, partially. I mean, the, the RE based close form impulsive solver is a state of the art algorithm. For example, Professor D'Amico flown in a couple so, of missions. There is a, a, a difference in the in technology level. Right, that's good, yeah. So uh, we start from well proven, even if there is novelty here because these are three inputs maneuvers and there is, uh, these are analytical solutions relying on you know, state of the art, uh, something that I developed uh, in the past, then the flow on tandem X, on previous mm -hmm. So this is a step beyond that in terms of optimality and, uh, and flexibility of these maneuvers. But this is the highest TRL that we have then all the rest has not flown in the past. And so um, while implementing, since we have, it's good to have options. So the idea is to have, through telecommand, a mode selection, mm -hmm. where we could activate in terms of complexity, you know, the simple, this is the simplest one you know, with the, the, the risk solver, and then the reachable safety approach, which is more uh, computationally expensive and, uh, more demanding. So the, the two interchangeable ones are kind of like the reachable set solver and the Tikkun regularized. So like the Tikkun regularized square is, as I was saying, like you fix the time of the maneuver and you solve like for minimizing like the terminal error like in a least square sense. And this can be done with really like, um, I mean, it's really like a close for like least square problem more or less. Yeah. Tikkun regularized though, which means that- If you look at the more the signs, so these are the only two that are in parallel that can meet the requirements of the science board. For the others one instead, uh, they are needed. Um, uh, however, throughout the uh, you know ultimate uh, uh, validation and verification and all the uh, you know ultimate testing of the algorithm, so uh, it might be that we favor one over the other when we get to the refining and the integration of the algorithms and so forth. So, yeah, I'm definitely interested to learn more about the, in that idea of like what you guys have been working on in these areas. It's very active very for us too. Um, it's very interesting also the rationale why we got to the reachable set theory approach, for mm -hmm. example, because um, uh, the typical approach is based on complex optimization mm -hmm. or, or, uh, or uh, describing the control problem to a model with control of discretized time um, and then introduce unknowns at each time step. Mm -hmm. So, bumping up uh, the computational effort dramatically depending on what is the duration. Uh, of your of your configuration, and so we uh, we were able uh, to define a, not a direct but an indirect optimization method that is that sold for those optimal times, so, so without requiring the dense discretization of the time scale, so to reduce the computational effort, um, and that, that's a new algorithm that we would like to try here uh, for to meet the requirements of this mission. Um, and uh, except for the Tikkun of the realization, this is something that you know, Tomato recently came up with as a the minimalistic, uh, simple approach. Exactly. Um, you're getting, actually, the, 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 the plot I'm, I'm showing here, this is kind of like, this is actually an interesting plot. Substantially, so is so here I'm projecting the relative position and velocity between spacecraft along the line of sight, so along like the direction of the sun we want to observe. So in this space, which is kind of longitudinal lateral, is where the alignment requirements live, more or less. And I, I need to describe a little bit more in detail here, but substantially, what happens is that here for like more or less 12 orbit, we are tracking standby mode, then we are transferring the sun. Say, for the oscillation, so these are passively Mm -hmm. It's a safe trajectory, so there is an oscillating pattern. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. So you are transferring to science, so then at this green line we are entering science, and these two red lines here are two observations. 
they seem two red lines, but in reality, as we will see in the next slide, in reality are four lines. So two pairs of lines, each one separated by 10 seconds. And you actually see like in the next slide, but substantially all our objective is substantially when these two red lines are at 10, within an interval of 10 seconds, we want to have like this black line contained within 40 meters plus minus 15 millimeters. Mm -hmm. And we want to have this black line here at like zero plus 18 millimeters. And we want to have kind of like this black line here, which is kind of like zero plus 10 minus two, two times 10, 10 minus four. And this is like one single case in which actually we are actually getting like the alignment we want. But like, for example, like we, here we have zoomed in at 31 orbits, which is kind of, I think is the second line here. And you can actually see how the black line gets into this like window of like 14 plus minus 15 millimeters. Target box. Mm -hmm. And that target box and this black line actually gets within like 18 millimeters here and within like the constraints on the velocity. On the other hand, as I said, this is kind of like a lucky case because actually we are getting within the box, but as I was like saying, we don't aim to achieve that kind of like alignment at every attempt. Therefore, what we do is kind of like a Monte Carlo line analysis on multiple attempts, and we want to show kind of like that the uh, overall like probability distribution kind of have the properties we, we aim at, which is actually what we are aiming for a 20% for each alignment, and here we are showing actually a observation success of 52%. On the other hand, I want to get slow here, but because this kind of actually Monte Carlo analysis is, so these plots here are actually obtained with the current version of the flight software, which as I said, implements this kind of like Tikhonov regularized, um, it implements like this kind of Tikhonov regularized control for like the science mode. This Monte Carlo line, we are, we are moving on a, on a flight software development sense in the, towards the integration of control and nav and performing this kind of like Monte Carlo analysis on the flight software. But we are not there yet from like a flight software development standpoint. This kind of like Monte Carlo analysis, which I want, I'm showing here instead, we're obtaining uh, substantially a version of the control argument which was implemented in um, MATLAB and was integrated with digital through max functions. So it was kind of like not like a final product. So we, are, we, we haven't yet. So our objective actually in, the, in this coming months is to obtain this kind of like Monte Carlo plots using the flight software. So like validating our flight softwares in C++ obviously like, uh, and getting this kind of like probabilistic uh, performances using the flight software. And this is still targeting at 2024? 20, 20%. Is that 20% uh, like the no. readiness of 2024. 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20. ah, ah, okay. Yeah, yeah, okay. It's not NASA scale. It's a deep And the, the actuation system for these are is a pretty, pretty difficult that's for us, which is just another new new thing, right? Yeah. Oh, that's the Ohio State. One of the main miracles, and actually, yeah, actually, there has, there, there has been a. I mean, I would, I would put you, this is actually the, the the propulsion system has been developed at, at Georgia Tech, but there has been like lately a lot of discussions because this cold gas propulsion system has several constraints in terms of like actually maximum input bit as well as like timing between bits. That's so. <laughs> so, so there is like there is a lot of headache because we are computing this kind of very cool maneuver plans, but then when you actually have to actuate them, you ended up having actually maneuvers spread it out about around portions of the orbit because obviously you have to kind of like quantize and then spread them out around the it's orbit, almost which robust. is which makes like um, so, so you take some performances here and then you filter through like the real actuation and then you want to actually see what we are actually going to end up having. So. Here I'm showing cool results, but to understand that all these results will need to be tested from like an integrated standpoint with now on the flight software, and then also from an integrated standpoint on the actual like satellite bus integrating with like actuation. So here, here I'm shooting about here I'm shooting high. Let's say so really this speaking about the product. So we are really working across from new algorithms all the way to delivery something that yeah. that, that should work. It's quite challenging. You know, I'm impressed by the students are doing. Like in the very final part of the presentation here, I, I want to go. I want to focus more on like on an aspect that I've actually been was kind of like one of the like focus aspects of my dissertation. Like here, you see the separation trend over the the mission. So in 
in standby, we have kind of like this, I, I'm plotting here both 3D and then RN and RT projection of the separation between spacecraft. So the black line is the 3D separation and then RN and RT are the projection in the RN and RT plane. So in standby, we have separation on the order of 200 meters. During transfer, the separation drop down on observation. And here you have around like um, 40 meter observation and then you, you increase back. This is the instantaneous separation between spacecraft. On the other hand, from a full tolerance perspective, what you would like to have, and this is actually a sample transfer and connects to what we're like saying before. So the, the bold blue line is the control trajectory, which transfer from standby, which is the green line, to science, which is like this orbital configuration here in the center. So if you want to have passive safety, what you would want to have is not just having safe separation on the, like, while you are on the bold blue line, but you want to have safe separation also if you lose, if you fail a maneuver and you lose control at any instant of the transfer and you start moving along these dashed lines, which are the uncontrolled trajectory you may follow if you lose control at that instant. And not only you want safe separation along these uncontrolled trajectory, but you want safe separation robust to uncertainties, which are generated by a substantially previous maneuver application and other, other things. And these are actually results I, I obtained within my dissertation using kind of like a convex, actual sequential convex optimization based algorithm, which uh, probably won't be like the first like attempt for the real mission, which was, because it's kind of like computationally expensive. But though it's very interesting because like these results are informing a lot our real transfer design strategy, which is gonna be which is gonna start from these results and then reason probably more in close form because what you can see here is that the ellipses which are drawn by the uncontrolled trajectory can be like straight related to the value of the relative orbital elements which size kind of like the relative or like the tangential like safety leaps you're keeping while you're transferring. The four by properly kind of like defining a guidance plans of the transfer with proper constraints on the relative orbital elements you can achieve these kind of like possibly safe constraints all throughout the transfer. The cool thing of the, for example, the work I was proposing in my thesis is that if you use convex optimization, you can possibly obtain this kind of like automatically by solving a convex program. And this, a sequential convex program, and this has been kind of like the focus of my, of part of my research. This, for example, is another, uh, this, are, this was a two orbit transfer, this is kind of like a five orbit transfer. And as I was like saying, in, in in, in the research of my PhD, I've looked at this kind of like problem of passive safety and also in the relation with the standard collision avoidance. In particular, like when you want to enforce collision avoidance, what you want to do is to enforce like safe separation just along the controller trajectory. If you want to have passive safety, instead you have these kind of like trees which are composed by all the possible uncontrolled trajectory which are follow if you lose control. And you want to enforce safe separation also along these uncontrolled trajectories. This kind of like determined if you want to actually formalize this kind of passive safety constraints in a robust way within an optimal control problem, which can be solved, for example, like through sequential convex optimization, what you end up having is a pretty high number of constraints. In particular, you're going to have a number of constraints which scales cubic with the number of time samples. And what kind of like one of the results of my PhD was that if you are using variation of parameters, so like mapping this kind of optimization problem in this integration constant space, which at the very end is can also be mapped to the relative orbital element space or can be just like the space of the instantaneous initial conditions along the control trajectory, you're able to reduce the effective number of constraints which are needed to enforce passive safety of one polynomial degree. And here I'm going like pretty fast, but like the idea here is substantially, and these, like, these results are continuing my PhD thesis, but substantially the idea is that you initially assume the integrability of the dynamics after contingency, and you will formalize a constraints on the instantaneous initial, initial condition on the control trajectory, which kind of guarantees safety all along the uncontrolled arcs. And then you relax this assumption of the integrability of the dynamics along the uncontrolled arcs, by compensating for non integrable effects as well as uncertainty effects within a bound. And then you end up substantially enforcing these constraint, this constraints within your uh, sequential convex program. I'll ask you there. How did you reduce the model? I mean, reduce Yes, your so like the, the key idea is that, so what you want is that, for example, this is your controller trajectory. Mm -hmm. 
at potentially at any instance of this control trajectory, you may lose control. At this kind of like generated like, sorry, these two branches, which are just like two uncontrolled trajectories, which are followed if, for example, agent K lose controls at instant TI, yeah. and agent J lose control at instant TL. Variational parameters tells you just that substantially you can, like if you assume integrability of the dynamics of the contingency, mm -hmm. you just have a map which links the initial, the integration constants or more or less the initial condition along the control trajectories mm -hmm. with any value of the state along the uncontrolled trajectory to like a map which is just the integrated dynamics map. And it's the same for like this agent at this instance along this arc. Okay. The idea substantially is then to understand where 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 is the instant when is the instant of worst worst case occurrence of the constraints along this couple of uncontrolled trajectory and formalize the minimum separation along this true uncontrolled arc as a single function of the initial conditions at contingency ah, instant. Got it. Okay. And this substantially what it does is that instead of having to enforce co as many constraints, so instead of having substantially to check for safe separation at each instant along the uncontrolled trajectory, you just have a constraint for each pair of initial conditions. And this reduces substantially number of constraints by exactly one polynomial degree. Because substantially, if you have a cubic number, it becomes quadratic. If it's actually a one, a one agent case, if it's quadratic, it becomes linear, more or less. I get it. Thank you. Yeah. And, and though here there is an assumption, which is the assumption of integrability of the dynamics after contingency, but you can relax it and account for like bounded non interval effect and uncertainty within a bound, which is this bound beta. This is the work I did in my thesis, but during my postdoc, actually, now I'm, I'm developing further on this model and also inserting some kind of like machine learning components for like reducing some kind of like assumptions like which are like present in this kind of like uh, formalization. So that's future work. But in any case, like at the very end, what you obtain is like a reduction of the number of constraints, which in the moment in which they're actually enforced within the optimization problem you want to solve, entails kind of like a reduction of the solution time at the very end. And also you make substantially like the solution time independent from the discretization along the uncontrolled arcs. So here you have like in a Cartesian space you kind of have an explosion if you kind of end up discretizing a lot because you have like number of constraints which kind of like explode like cubic. Instead here you lose this kind of like dependence from the discretization along the controlled arc, and so you have this kind of behavior of the computation time, which kind of like map like the behavior of the number of constraints you are you are implementing. But in any case, um, to con to conclude, since probably went pretty long, uh, is that for the Bayesian mission we are demonstrating the capability of achieving 40 meter separation formation fine alignment with a relative position control accuracy of about one centimeter and a stability down to one millimeter over repeated observations of 10 seconds. This is using differential GPS and a suite of control algorithms which ranges from closed form solution with flight heritage to optimization based control algorithms. Uh, full tolerance motion safety is accounted in all phases of the mission, combining closed loop passively safe control and reactive escape approaches. And the next step are mainly integration, both in between flight soft nav and flight software control, hardware in the loop testing in the lab with the flat set, hardware in the loop testing on the satellite buses, and then obviously launching 